Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, human resources strategy for researchers at CESIC, all aboard. First the steps in the implementation of the human resources strategy for researchers. And uh, uh, okay, uh, well, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Well, first of all, uh, what does uh, this title mean? It means uh, that the main goal of this uh, webinar is uh, to make the CSIC researchers aware, uh, the CSIC researchers aware of the relevance of uh, their commitment with uh, this strategy for a successful implementation. Before starting with the program, just to tell you that uh, you can send uh, your questions or comments uh, to the chat, and we will read them, uh, all the questions and comments uh, afterwards. We have a schedule sessions for the questions and, and answers. Uh, the first one will be at 12, and the other one close to the end, at 40 to, to 12. Uh, so let's uh, start uh, with the first uh, session about it will be about the state of play of this strategy at the CSIC. Um, first of all, uh, Moira Torren, the head of the European Union policy and strategy and, uh, at the CSIC, uh, will uh, summarize uh, what the state of play. Later on, uh, it will be Luis Montoliu, the president uh, of the CSIC Ethics Committee, who will present uh, the CSIC Code of Good Scientific Practices. So uh, let's start uh, uh, with Moira. Moira, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Berta. Good morning, everybody. I will share my screen now. And hope that everything goes right. Okay, I hope you can see the screen now. The presentation, fine. So, uh, Thank you, Berta, as I was saying, and thank you to everybody that's watching us uh, at the moment. And I hope that you find this, uh, this workshop today uh, very useful and, and that you learn uh, a lot of things. So uh, I will start with the brief introduction, uh, even though Connor and Michelle and Xavier and, of course, Anna are going to uh, elaborate on this, uh, uh, I'm sure, more uh, later on, I think that in order to um well have you song to, to, to so you know what we're talking about uh it, it's uh it would be useful to make a little introduction uh in three topics of course the european charter and code for researchers the human resources strategy for researchers and the human resources excellence in research award okay so the uh european charter and code for researchers uh even though we we frequently, well, we refer to them as they were just one document, and, and uh, we, for short, we short names as the, uh, as the charter and code. Um, we, there are, they are two different documents, okay? Uh, the first one is the European Charter for Researchers that contains a set of principles and requirements specifying roles, responsibilities, and rights of researchers and of their employers, okay? And the second one is a code of conduct for the recruitment of researchers that includes uh, that this recruitment should ensure the transparency, uh, its transparency and the equal treatment of all applicants. Um, the charter and code are addressed to researchers and to research employers and research funders in both public and private sectors. As I said, it contains key elements uh, in the EU's uh, policy to boost the researcher's career. And I may uh, add reference here to the European Research Area because, as you know, it's one of the key pillars of the of the era, and, and even more now on the new European Research Area. It's uh, to boost research careers and 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 mobility. So it's it's uh, this this two documents contains key elements on this on this uh, issue, and it's um, well it's differentiated in forty principles divided in four areas that we will see just now. Okay. So the first area, uh, it's about ethical and professional aspects. There you, uh, you can see the, the, the principles. The second is about recruitment and selection. The third is working conditions and social security. And the fourth is training and development, okay? 
And now we're moving to the human resources strategy for researchers uh, that this strategy uh, aims to support research institutions and funding organizations in the implementation of the principles, the 40 key principles that uh, I just mentioned, of the charter and code in their policies and practices. Okay. And one, one a way uh, that we have, or the that European Commission has of recognizing uh, this uh, the commitment with these principles is the Human Resources Excellence in Research Award. This award, uh, as I said, recognizes the institutions which make progress in aligning their human resources policy with this 40 principle. So this, uh, this Excellence in Research Award, it's uh, awarded in base uh, in, in, well, yeah, based on a customized action plan that the institution said, okay. And this award gives public recognition to those, to those institutions uh, in, in the sense that they, they are making progress um, aligning to these principles. And it also uh, makes them more attractive uh, to all the, the uh, researchers that are looking for an institution to uh, develop their career or to host their project. Okay, it's one of the main uh, advantages of, of, of this award. So uh, what's the procedure to obtain this award? Well, there is uh, an initial phase, that is the, the application phase. There is an implementation phase, and then, and then there's a third one that is the award renewal phase. So the initial phase, uh, it, it contains two, two main steps. Uh, first of all, you have to endorse the, chart, the principles contained in the charter and code. And second, you, you apply for the, for the award. Uh, you have to send a gap analysis, uh, with the SWOT uh, analysis, including uh, the OTMR checklist that uh, it's uh, open, transparent, and merit-based recruitment checklist that it, it certifies or it, it, it uh, confirms that the institution uh, complies with this uh, with this uh, three uh, key aspects of, of the recruitment and an initial action plan design. Uh, after that, that uh, phase. Uh, it, it starts the implementation of the action plan and then the implementation of the revised uh, action plan. Okay, and the third one it's a uh, uh, consists of uh, consecutive uh, renewals uh, with and without site visits. Uh, that's it. This is a uh, well. You're going. I'm, I'm sure that we're going to see that uh, uh, in more deeper uh, afterwards. But just so you so you know uh, what what's what's the procedure and this is where we are right now at the FASIC. So uh, the current state of the, of the, of the implementation or, or, or what, 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 what we've been uh, doing with this. So, uh, well, first of all, it's, it's important for me to say that the, the FASIC, as you know, it's, it's an institution that it's highly committed to all the principles of the European research area. Uh, um, of it, since, since, since in the start of, of, of the era in the 2000s, We've been very committed to 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 be one of the key actors or, or to align uh, all our activities with the European research area. So, uh, um, in, in alignment with that, uh, in November two thousand eleven, we already endorsed the principles of the Charter and Code. Okay, but since we we decided or or, or the institution decided to uh, apply for the award, we we reconfirmed or we yeah reaffirmed our commitment with these principles again in March 2019 when we submitted the uh, the letter stating our intention to apply for the award. Okay, so uh, once we submitted that that letter and that that recommitment with the principles of the Charter and Code in March 2019, we had 12 months to prepare all the documentation and to send it to the European Commission. So in July, June of 2019, uh, we conducted a survey within all the, the personnel and we prepared the gap analysis and the SWOT uh, analysis as well, and uh, the initial action plan design and the checklist. All this uh, processes was, uh, the process was, uh, uh, involved all the all the institution. It, it, it was uh, very very um, uh, how could I say very inclusive in the way that that it it, it involved 
uh, people for all from all the from the of course from the headquarters, but also for the the um, the, the institutes and the research centers and from different stages of the uh, research career. So it was uh, uh, as inclusive as, as possible, and it was steered by the uh, deputy secretary general from human resources and the postgraduate and specialization department. But it, it involved all the all the institution. So. Uh, we sent the application in March 2020, and in August 2020, the Commission gave us a, a response, uh, requesting a letter, a few uh, clarifications, and we resubmitted the uh, application in October uh, 2020. So we got the the letter uh, awarding us with the with this uh, CEO with this award, uh, the, the Excellence in Research, in February uh, 2021. So. And from that day, we have 12 month, uh, 24 months, sorry, two years to implement all the actions that we uh, committed to in the action plan. Okay, so our action plan contains 58 actions, uh, 58 actions, excuse me. Uh, in the words of the commission, it was highly ambitious. So uh, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, it, as I said, uh, as well, it, 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 since the beginning, this, this, Commitment to this strategy involves all the institution. I mean, this is not an isolated uh, initiative from the headquarters. It, it requires the commitment and the the change of mentality or or, or of ways of, of working uh, of all the institution. It's linked, as I said, to tight deadlines and it's subject to evaluation because, uh, as as you see here, after these twenty four months. We're going to to um, receive. Uh, we're going to say suffer, but that's that's not the term. To receive an interim assessment uh, to see uh, if if we are implementing uh, the actions that we said. If we are doing that, then we have thirty six more months to keep uh, uh, um, to to, to uh, keep yeah to implement the the revised revised action plan. And if we are not, if that, that assessment turns out to be negative, then our seal, our word will be removed. So, so this is not something that we should take for granted because if we don't keep our commitment with it, uh, then we will lose it, okay? So, so it's, it's a continuous process as, as, as you can say. Okay, so of those uh, 58 actions, uh, 80 of them are ongoing, currently ongoing. Two, uh, two of them are fully completed. One of them was the update of the code of scientific good practices of the, of the institution. And the other one is uh, some uh, action that, that um, was uh, directed to invest some uh, in basic infrastructures and, and some centers, okay? And 19 of them are planned for a later uh, start date from starting from September, October of, of this year, okay? So our action plan is uh, well fully aligned with the charter and code, and it's uh, divided in, in four main topics. That it's, uh, as I said, ethical and professional aspects, uh, recruitment and selection, working conditions and social security, and training and development. Okay, so I'm not going to go through those uh, 58 actions, but uh, so you know where uh, they 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 are fully aligned with these principles, and they uh, include. Well, ethical topics, uh, actions on non-discrimination of the selection boards and the composition and the way uh, that they can work, uh, work increase the visibility and transparency in, and the recruitment and selection processes, uh, improve working conditions, uh, disability and, and of employment, support for mobility, uh, well, advice and, and counsel, and of course, supervision and, and promote the recognition of, of supervision. So uh, just, I think I'm finishing, I'm, uh, I'm not very late. Uh, well, uh, other issues that we have to take into account when implementing this, this action plan is the, it is aligned and, and we, we will have to uh, see how we can uh, put together the new strategic plan in uh, 2025 of the institution and of course, uh, national or European strategies. But it's it's already very interlinked, and 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 we're uh, of course it's going to be uh, uh, aligned. 
uh, we have to take into account uh, as well, or, or we have included, uh, not, not taken into account, included initiatives that we've all, we already had uh, that are closely related to, the, um, to this strategy. For instance, the anti plagiarians the Open Science Mandate, the, as I said, the Code of Good Scientific Practices. And we, we need to see this as an opportunity to, uh, for the institution to evolve and improve. Uh, and, and of course, we, we need to be aware that it will require new ways to address key issues and instruments okay? so to, to facilitate the implementation of this plan. And, and again, uh, this needs the involvement of our entire research community and the administrative and management units. So we are all in this together. It's not, uh, as I said, some, some, uh, some isolated uh, uh, initiative uh, from the headquarters that, uh, well, I will keep uh, informed about it, but we, we will have to work together in order to, to achieve this and to keep it because one thing that we, we should not forget is that we've been granted this award, not for our previous actions, I mean, not for, for what we've done, but for what we said that we're going to say, okay, or that we're going to do. So uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's like in advance, the, the, the award, and, and if, we don't, if we don't implement the actions, if we don't follow these principles, if we're not aligned with the charter and code, then we will lose this award, and and this this uh, this award is it's it's uh, it's it's important not only because of course as I said it makes us uh, very attractive for attracting talent and keeping it, uh, but because it, it shows the commitment of the institutions with the principles with the, with the main one of the main principles of the European study. So um, well, uh, just uh, let's work together on this. And and thank you very much. That's it. Well, we'll stop. Thank you very much, Moira. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Moira. And now let's uh, move on to the presentation of Luis Montoliu, president of the CESIC Ethics Committee. He hasn't been able to be here today with us, but uh, he has been so kind to record his presentation. So uh, please, the floor is for Luis. Good morning, I'm Luis Montoliu, the president of the CSIC Ethics uh, Committee, and I'm delighted to join you this morning in this uh, workshop on the human resources strategy for researchers to report on the new CSIC code of good scientific practices that we have just released. This is 10 years after the first code was published in 2011. We have also released an infography, normally at the moment only in Spanish, with the headlines and the most important points and a QR code for all researchers to download directly the code for whatever they are. So the contents of this code uh, um, so review all aspects of the scientific activity. So let's have a look uh, quickly on the different aspects that we have included in this new and updated uh, code. At the beginning, the purpose and the scope of this code is, is to guide the scientific activity and ensure the quality of the CSIC research while preventing inappropriate uh, practices is applicable to all temporary or permanent research staff. And then we are promoting research integrity, which is the observance and promotion of the highest professional standards. The responsible conduct of research has these following funding values, among others, honesty, transparency, professional commitment, accountability, objectivity, impartiality, independent, reliability, diligence, respect and recognition of the work of others. Regarding the different activities uh, associated with research, we need to remind that all activity raising ethical concerns must receive a favorable evaluation by our committee prior commencement. 
then we need to take care that researchers know and apply optimal design and methodology, optimal research management, and comply with all the different laws affecting research with human subjects, animal research, safety, health, and environmental protection. Regarding evaluation tax, this needs to be done rigorously with confidentiality, impartiality, objectivity, independence, qualification, diligence, and avoiding, of course, the conflicts of interest. Regarding the training and supervision, the exercise of leadership, there are obligations for both the research director, the mentor or supervisor, and as well for the research trainees. Then we also define the different aspects that need to regulate the collaborations in the research groups, as well as external collaborations, contract research, and consulting activities. Regarding the management and protection of results, then we have to promote and foster proper management of them. Regarding dissemination of the results, we have to remind researchers have a moral duty to publish the research results in an open interpretation, transparent, honestly, with precision and accuracy, without excluding negative results and giving the due credit. We are accountable, we are responsible, and then we need to define when authorship is deserved regarding having participated in the conception, design, proposal, acquisition of data, conducting experiments, analysis, interpretation, discussion, or writing up of the manuscripts. Another important aspect in this new version of the code is the, the relation with the communication media, with the mass media, we should not jeopardize the image or credibility of the CSIC, and we need to take into account that our personal opinions do not necessarily reflect those of the CSIC. We need to provide information to media that are proven, verified, updated, and contextualized. We should not assume institutional representation unless given, and we have always to declare any conflict or interest according to the manual we published in 2015. We have also a part that is taking care of the violations of research integrity, uh, mainly fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism of data, as well uh, as another list of unacceptable, unacceptable uh, practices. And our committee is the institutional body that has the specific competence in matters of research integrity. Finally, we have an institutional commitment in which the CSIC is recognized to pursue excellence and is committed to open science, sharing of data and publication in open access journals, as well as promoting and fostering integrity, honesty, training activities, equal opportunities, inclusion of gender perspective, progression towards achieving full equality and adopting measures to protect staff from occupational and sexual harassment, as well as facilitating the work of his research staff. Last but not least, I would like to acknowledge and thank the contributions of, of all the members of the current CSIC Ethics Committee that have been preparing this current and updated code, as well as the previous committee led by Miguel Garcia Guerreros, who uh, or initiate this new code. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Ah. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Luis, even uh, virtually, that uh, you will be able to watch uh, the video afterwards. And um, uh, then move on to the next uh, speaker, Michele Rosa Clot. He is the um, Human Resources Strategy for Researchers uh, Portfolio Manager at the Directorate General uh, for Research and Innovation at the European Commission. He uh, started uh, working on this strategy and the Charter and Code in 2019 when he moved to DG uh, RTD. Today, he is the portfolio manager and he's in charge of the different aspects of this strategy with particular focus uh, both on process and expert uh, coordination. Uh, so, uh, he's going to, to, to give us an update about this uh, charter and code and the strategy. 
So please, Michele, the floor is yours. Thank you, Berta. And uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Voila. Just a second to, okay. You should be able to see, let me also try to remove the pictures. Okay. Okay, thank you so much for having me and thanks for your uh, high commitment to the Charter and Code and the HRS4R as we heard the previous presentations. I will present here uh, things that you already have heard in the first presentation by Moira Torrent on the state of play, but um, I will present them in a slightly uh, different perspective. So, uh, I will start uh, presenting you this small timeline to explain how the process came into, uh, into, into being. Uh, first of all, I would like to start uh, with the sentence Moira finished, used to finish her presentation. We are in all these together, uh, especially because I would like to stress the fact that together, we all of us are together means also and foremost the researchers who are at the center of uh, the HRS for our process and the charter and code philosophy. Uh, in 2005, uh, the, the commission issued their recommendation, the recommendation 2005-1251, you can find it on Google, uh, uh, publishing the charter and code and inviting um, uh, research institutions from the member states to uh, adhere to the 40 principles that were uh, spelled in the Charter and Code. This is uh, done into, with two legs, one directly um, directed to the, to the researchers with the European Charter for Researchers and the other one to uh, the structure of recruiting researchers. And I would like to stress that researchers, again, as I said before, are at the center of this focus. Uh, I would like to, to go on stressing this point because the active participation of researchers to the HRS for our process is a, a central element for the growth of the process, for the growth of the institution, CSIIC, for the growth of the experience on the charter and code altogether, that is a, a constantly adapted document. Um, as uh, Moira has uh, already mentioned, this is based on the four uh, thematic areas. I will uh, go very fast on that. And the uh, 40 principles, which range from research freedom to gender balance uh, to the open, transparent, merit-based recruitment and intellectual property rights. Uh, these are spelled out clearly as a list of principles in the Charter and Code. The HRS 4R is the mechanism of implementation of the Charter and Code. And this came into being in 2008 uh, as a process of, uh, voila, in a nutshell, a process, a, a cyclical process for voluntary structure and monitor uh, assessment, which is based on a gap analysis and an action plan. We have seen in, uh, in uh, the, the first presentation, a very famous uh, slide, this one, uh, which describe the, uh, the process of this uh, con continuous assessment process. I will not get into the details. That's exactly where CSIC is with the deadline on the 26th of February, 2023. Uh, one thing that maybe I would like to, to, to stress uh, is that at the interim assessment, the institution is not in jeopardy, jeopardy to lose the award. Uh, the interim assessment came into, into being only to help the institution to stay on track with the implementation of the action plan that was uh, assessed uh, at the initial phase. The, as Moira already uh, said, uh, the subsequent, subsequent 36 months, three years, 
will lead to a renewal assessment, which is instead an assessment that will, will assess uh, and uh, um, assess if the, the logo has to be renewed or not. In 2014, the Commission introduced the best effort obligation for all beneficiaries um, in a H2020 model grant agreement. This was spelled in a rather technical but famous uh, article, Article 32, stating that all institution, uh, research institution, uh, which are um, accesses to funding through H2020 uh, pro, um, projects have to demonstrate their best effort to implement the, 20, the 40 principles of the Charter and Code. The, since the HRS4R uh, logo testifies the best effort to have the, the logo uh, is a demonstration of the best effort obligation. I can already uh, anticipate to you that this uh, concept of Article 32 will be carried forward into Horizon Europe. Uh, the model grant agreement of Horizon Europe is not yet published, so I cannot quote a, a specific article. In uh, several drafts, I have seen uh, uh, that this will become Article 18, but basically the substance of the article will, be, remain, will remain identical. Uh, is there a question? No, okay. Um, in 2017, the strength and HRS for, uh, for our procedure came into being, introducing uh, the OTMR checklist. And in 2018, the, A2, the E tool was introduced, meaning that every single application for HRS for R that was done until that moment, which was manual, had to be uh, injected into the E tool to continue on the HRS for R process. Uh, a couple of words on where we are today. Um, before getting to details, I uh, uh, would like to stress that the chart that we present are all publicly available on the Euraxis <coughs> website in its uh, HRS4R um, section on uh, a dashboard. The, the dashboard will contain all the statistics that I am presenting now. This is a, a take up. Uh, of uh, the award of the awarded uh, organization from 2010, 20, and 2021. Uh, up to today, uh, we have almost 1,300 institutions who have endorsed the Charter and Code principle, uh, and 624 research institutions who have received the award. This the discrepancy uh, exists because as in the first uh, years of existence of the Charter and Code, uh, the charter code could be endorsed without being uh, uh, in the process, can be endorsed today without entering the award process. So we have uh, uh, many more uh, institutions endorsing the, the, the charter and code than we have in HRS4R. Uh, one thing that I would like to stress is that this is not a merely European contained process. There are over 40 countries. So many non-European countries as well, who are participating to HRS4 and have been awarded. Uh, 67 have been awarded in 2019, 72 in 2020, 55 only in the first three uh, trimesters of 2021, and many more are in the process of obtaining uh, the award, the initial phase. Um, it, uh, these are the, the assessment, uh, something that is not impacting CSIC for the moment are the site visit. This is something that impacts the renewal phase only. But of course, uh, um, I would like to mention that because of course, like everybody, we have been impacted by COVID-19 as well. So uh, new um, forms of site visit has, have been developed uh, or creating a the concept of the virtual site visit will stay in place until the travel limitation will be in place. 
this, uh, this is a pie chart for the distribution. As you can see, Spain uh, accounts for one over one fifth of the research institution which obtained the award. CSIC uh, um, obtained the, the endorsement in 2019 and uh, received the HR logo in 2021. Is so uh, it's uh, it's part of this. Uh, big 20%. Uh, this distribution is highly subjected to national conditions. Um, this is a currently under analysis in a, in a study that the commission has issued, which uh, was supposed to be presented in these days, but uh, had a few, uh, few days of delay. So I will not be able to report on that for the moment. Uh, some reported benefits. This has already been tackled in the presentation to which um, uh, uh, were, were oh. given before. Uh, very fast, uh, I would like to stress that those benefits have been reported not by the Commission, uh, seldom by the experts, but mainly by the institution when assessed and uh, by the researchers themselves. Uh, these are going from uh, internal uh, benefits to external benefits. We already talk of internalization and uh, visibility uh, for the, prog the progress uh, itself uh, frame into the process of the HIS4 itself is uh, highly beneficial. And I cannot go ahead. Oops, I'm sorry, there is. A... I will go very fast. I have this window appearing. I apologize and stops everything. Uh, the study I just mentioned, uh, the role of the study in combination with the presentation uh, that will be given by Zaskun Lakunza after me on uh, the Triangle Task Force work is directed not only to take stock of the existing situation, policy measures, national differences, uh, and uh, HRS for and charter and code experiences, but also, and most importantly, and equally importantly, sorry, will be a process of uh, revision, revamping, strengthening of the charter and code and the policy measures supporting it. Because as I introduced this presentation, the charter and code is already 15 years old and needs to be adapted to the current challenges and uh, the new, um, uh, the new uh, needs. So this is this will be presented very soon. The charter and code will go uh, through a process of revision together with the council. Uh, the ERAC task force will provide uh, an amount of suggestions that uh, will be taken into consideration in this process. And uh, probably this will be started uh, in the upcoming uh, weeks. So, I, um, I, I am terribly sorry. I keep having issues with my sharing. But this was my last slide, I believe. Indeed, it was. So I will be at your disposal for any question you may have uh, on uh, this presentation or any other question concerning Charter and Code and HRS4R. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michele. I'm sure that there will be questions for you later on. Now, uh, let's move uh, to the presentation of uh, Xavier Eckhout, Researcher's uh, Mobility and Career Development Project Manager at the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology. His presentation uh, will be a review of the Charter and Code in light of the new European research area. So, uh, Xavier, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, everybody, and, and thank you very much uh, to, to our colleagues from, from FESIC for, for inviting us to share this work. Um, actually, it's, it's quite nice that we, I mean, we've had a, 
a very nice introduction, both from the side of Moira and from the side of Michele to, to the content of this, of this presentation, because uh, as you will see, what I'm going to share here with you is, um, is the, um, the, the work of the Triangle Task Force, which um, has, been, uh, has been taking place along the last year. And uh, as mentioned by, by Michele, uh, the idea is that this, this will be providing some, some food for thought and some, some, some input to, uh, to a future development of the chartering code. So uh, as presented by, by Berta, I'm, I'm Xavier Eichaud. I work at the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology. And the reason why I'm here is because uh, the work that has taken place uh, through this task force comes from three uh, working groups of the, of the ERA committee. It's uh, precisely the groups that you can see there, the, the Standing Working Group on Hope and Science and Innovation, which is chaired by, by Mark Van Holzbeek, by Van Holzbeek. Uh, the Standing Working Group of Human Resources and Mobility, uh, which is chaired by, by Cecilia Cabello, and the Standing Working Group on, on Gender in, in Research and Innovation. So these three expert groups uh, basically decided that uh, they would be working along the last two years in two goals that you can see there. One of them, uh, which I will not be presenting, but, uh, but I, I would like to, to mention and share with you where, where you can find the, the report. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the goals would be looking into recommendations on training incentives and evaluation of researchers uh, from the perspective of open science and innovation and of uh, gender equality. And the second work and the second goal, uh, which is the, the the work that I will be presenting here, was actually uh, doing this exercise of, of of a potential updating of the charter and code, taking into account the new policy developments and 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 particularly the the new the new era uh, the, or the future of era. Uh, this work, this this part of the task force was chaired by uh, the deputy delegate of Spain, which is Itascun Lacunza, who should have been the normal person presenting there. And in my case, as I'm working within the coordination of Odexis, um, I was I was providing this sort of secretariat uh, support to this to this work, and that's why why I'm putting it here. So let's say that I could uh, stop my presentation here, just passing two key messages that I would like to 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 the audience to have it clear. One of them. As I mentioned already, already uh, presented by by Michele, and that this is a work from these working groups, and it's of course one of the many inputs that can go and that we expect that that will be taken into account by the European Commission upon a possible uh, updating of the chartering code. Uh, and the second one is that we have a preliminary result of the work of this task force, which you can see in that in that uh, link. And uh, you can check the, the report where it stands, the, the work that has been done. And we're still, still taking input from stakeholders, uh, written input until the 1st of October. But I will go back to that at the end of the presentation. So apart from those two key messages, which are what, what I would like the, the audience to take home back, um, then I, I, will, I will present the objectives of the, of the task force, of this particular goal. Uh, I will. Uh, go through the, the main recommendations that came out from the work of the task force in terms of a possible updating of the chartering code. And uh, I will briefly show you how the, the possible uh, updated chartering code could look like based on these, on these recommendations. So as I said, the starting point is that uh, looking into the future of ERA, uh, the chartering code is already more than 15 years old document. Uh, so we wanted to just make, I like to put it an intellectual exercise, uh, taking into consideration or, or making a, a strong emphasis on, on gender equality in research and innovation and open science and innovation. Obviously, that's why there is a connection between the three that are working groups, but also on the teaching dimension of research, on the management of research talent, and on the assessment of research acti activities. The principles that have applied to the work of this task force is that we wanted to work in the sense of an evolution of the chartering code, not a revolution. We want to keep to the current spirit of the chartering code because we, as I will mention immediately, one of the main conclusions is that it's still extremely valid. Uh, and then we wanted to also, for practical reasons, uh, stay within the, the scope of the number of, art, uh, of, of articles that the current version of the chartering code has. So currently we have 40 principles, which are already quite a lot. So we really didn't want to move too far away from that, from that, um, from that number. 
uh, especially because, I mean, you've seen the numbers already in, in Miguel's presentation. We have more than, than, than 1,200 institutions uh, 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 adhering to the charter and code principles. Uh, so if any of these uh, recommendations are taken into account into the future development of the charter and code, it should allow for this smooth transition uh, with all the people that are already engaged in one way or another with the charter and code and of course the human resources strategy. And regarding the strategy, the strategy itself, I will mention it that it has been useful for us in order to do the work, uh, but uh, officially the, the process itself, the implementation of the charter and code principles is completely out of the scope of the work that we have been doing in this, in this group. So as I said, I mean, main recommendations, the first one is that the document remains valid and appropriate, that it's extremely relevant, uh, and uh, that there are a number of priorities that can be further strengthening. And I have already mentioned this. So gender inequality, open science and, and, and innovation, teaching, recognition of the profession, uh, which is some it's still an area in which we 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 need to to advance in within ETA, uh, taking into account uh, strengthening research assessment, and uh, also trying to 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 make this a bit more uh, how do you say this um, relevant to 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 the private sector to non-academic research employers. Uh, the way that we have done the work is basically uh, merging some some of the principles and downsizing downsizing some of the some of the principles. We've also been looking into the weight because the current uh, the current the structure of the charter and code. If you go through all of the forty principles, you will uh, any reader will immediately realize that some of the of the principles are really really wide and really really big, while others are very specific. So we have played a little bit with the weight of the of the different uh, of the different uh, uh, um, principles in order to to make this proposal. And uh, directly related with this, we have identified, we've made quite, a, quite an effort in trying to identify core and transversal principles, uh, which I will mention now that uh, how, how we have uh, proposed that this could, be, uh, this could be taken into account into a future, a future updating of the charter and code. Although the, the, the human resources strategy for researchers, as I said, is completely out of the scope of the work of this working group, we have taken it into account, especially through the, the, the use of the pillars that the process applied right now. So we will, as you will see, the, the result of the group is going to be presented, keeping those pillars into account. What we have done is basically we have gone through all of the reading, careful reading of all of the principles and uh, made an upgrade uh, if necessary, taking into account the principles mentioned before about gender equality, open, taking into account open science and so on. And uh, we have also taken a look into the uh, how the principles address the stakeholders, uh, trying to to somehow uh, keeping the general idea that all of the principles in one way or another apply or are relevant in different ways to the different stakeholders. We have also looked into the the uh, the updates of the of the definitions of the stakeholders. In the case of the research definition, uh, we have built like in the current version over the, the Frescati manual of the OCDE, uh, but trying to find a connection with the ESCO qualifications of, of, of skills and competences and occupations. Uh, we have tried to, to, as part of the researcher definition, to try to make a, an effort in making it clear that there are a, a diverse, there are diverse research uh, career paths uh, link with this the widening of skills and competences and, and responsibilities, and also to, to try to make it clear that when we're talking about a researcher, we're not talking about the individual researchers, so not thinking that a researcher needs to do all these different things with all these diverse uh, career paths and all the diverse skills and competences needed, but the research community. In the side of the, of the employer definition, uh, as I said, we have made this, this separation or this, if you wanted, uh, this, this wink towards the private sector in order to try to make it uh, the document as relevant as possible to the private sector. And then we have added uh, policymakers uh, specifically as a stakeholder of the chartering code. In the current version, uh, the introduction, you see that uh, there is a request for member states to, to try to, to align their policies uh, in order to, to meet the, the principles of the chartering code. So somehow that was already in the spirit, but we have proposed uh, to have them specifically as a stakeholder of the of the of a possible future uh, charter and code. 
Uh, we've also made a reflection about this separation as very nicely presented by Moira. You, you, we have the, the charter and code, we speak of it as a single document because you can get it in a single document, but they're actually two separated things. One which is a charter for researchers and research recruiters, a charter of principles, and then there is a code for the recruitment of, 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 of the researchers. The part of the code may have some legal implications, especially at the institutional level, in which we didn't want to, to get into because we were not in the, in the situation to do it. So that's why keeping this, I mean, working around this structure of the four pillars, which the strategy uses for the implementation was the way to work for it, to, to advance in the work. So this is a bit how the, how the current charter and code looks like under these four pillars, which are used as part of the strategy. And starting from this point, now I'm going to share with you quickly because you, can, you will be able to check it out in detail in the, in the available reports, which are public, uh, how the different pillars look like. So the first pillar, uh, which, we, which we, call, we would call research and ethical principles, the idea is that here we would have the big key principles which define the European research area and which should be mainstreamed somehow into the rest of the, of the, of the articles that we, that we included in each of the, of the other pillars. This is what it would look like. Uh, you would see there that the, the ones that are, that are uh, marked with a, with a star are the ones which are new principles, although some of the new principles are actually somehow a, a, a recycling previous ones. So you would have that in research ethical values, we would have research freedom, we would have open science as a new, as a new principle, research integrity as a new principle, responsible research to be aligned with, uh, with RRI, uh, with, with the concept of RRI. Public engagement will remain as it is. Gender equality is a new principle, but it really comes or it integrates the previous uh, uh, gender balance principle, which is part of gender equality, but somehow a bit shorter. And uh, embracing diversity would also come from a, from a, from a, uh, the uh, recycle of the of the um, of the previous uh, non discrimination principle. And then we would have teaching and the recognition of the profession. And once again, this would be the big European research values, what we would see as uh, big European research values, and that need to be streamlined into the rest of the principles. Uh, the second pillar, which would be recruitment and selection, basically remains as the same. Here, what we have is the articles, which are basically the ones that fall under the code for the recruitment of researchers. And uh, it doesn't, it didn't change much because actually this is a part of the charter and code which has already been addressed somehow uh, for updating through the implementation or the adding of the open transparent and merit-based recruitment toolkit as part of the, of the strategy. So how this would look, we put together the two articles that currently exist related to, to recruitment, one which is part of the charter, one which is part of the code. So we would merge them together and have one single uh, one, one single line for recruitment. Uh, selection would remain, transparency would remain. And judging merit also comes from the current code, but here we would incorporate some of these principles that I mentioned at the beginning. So the value of mobility, uh, the uh, gender equality considerations, and of course, open science practices. And then variations in CV, recognition, seniority, and postdoctoral appointments would remain the same. Third, working conditions and professional aspects, which currently in the, in the strategy is the pillar of working conditions and social security. Here, what we have put, or we, what we thought that would fit within this, this pillar would be all the, com the principles, to put it some way, that actually apply to any, any profession and obviously to the research profession. So this is how, how, how it would look. We would have stability and permanence of employment. Those would remain the same. And well, just to go into the detail, the only one which would change a little bit would be um, research culture, which is actually also somehow a, a, a revamping of the previous research environment principle of the current research environment principle, uh, but taking into account particularly the, the need of, of having or providing uh, open science infrastructures in order to, do, to perform open science. And last but not least, the last uh, pillar, which currently is the training and development, uh, we would rename it, we would re propose re renaming it into talent development and research evaluation. And here are the principles which are relating to fostering research talent and the holistic evaluation of research uh, activities. So here we would have two new, new principles, diversification of, of, of research careers 
and people and team management. Uh, supervision would somehow be also uh, upgraded because it, it would take into account uh, uh, current uh, principles under supervision, managerial duty, duties, and supervisors. And uh, the same would apply to evaluation and appraisal, where we would, like in the previous pillar, would also add the importance or the, the, the taking into account mobility, open science practices, and gender equality. As a result, our, our proposal of a possible future charter and code would remain in 32 principles, so not moving away too far from the 40 principles and actually somehow simplifying it. And uh, going back into the second key message that I wanted to share with you, uh, the, the work of this task force, you can find it in a document which is currently available in the Uraxis uh, portal in the policy library. Uh, you can download the report there look, to look into the details of what I tried to, to present here. And you are most welcome to provide any written input uh, to, uh, to, to us in order to take it into account. Uh, because although this is, um, as I said, it's, uh, we can put it as an intellectual exercise of, of this working group, uh, we are more than happy of receiving input from other stakeholders because obviously, I mean, when you talk about updating charter and code, there are many, many implications for reasons mentioned in the presentations before. And that would be all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Xavier. We will put the presentations in our website uh, so people uh, will be able to see this uh, email address to um, and send you all the, uh, the comments. Thank you very much. And now we are going to start with the questions and answers uh, session. And uh, please, uh, I encourage you to, to send as, um, as many questions as you want in the chat. Uh, first, uh, we have seen uh, one question, with, uh, one similar question from Alicia Pellegrina and Alberto Bascones. And the question is uh, how this strategy improves the career of researchers? Uh, maybe the answer is uh, not uh, so easy, but uh, maybe some uh, of, of you could uh, uh, tell us some key points about the improvement of the research uh, career. I don't know who wants to, to take this one. Maybe Xavier, Michele. No? <laughs> sure, I can, uh, okay. I can you. go ahead. Uh, of course, uh, we also have Connor with us who is uh, yes. uh, one of the extensor of the original charter and code and, uh, and an, a, a, an expert uh, of of uh, the assessment of the HRSFR process, so can be involved in the this discussion as well. First of all, um, or, okay, uh, how this uh, this improve the career of the researchers? Um, I cannot go on specific careers. First of all, let's remind that the general approach of the charter and code, the general the the holistic approach of the charter and code to research is because the concept, the, the definition of research on which we base the entire architecture of, of research work uh, is uh, the Frascati definition. So it's not, not necessarily STEM or non-STEM, it's both STEM and non-STEM. The research is the creative knowledge. So uh, I will not get into the details of a single career path. Uh, I will, uh, however, stress several elements. The first one, apart the ethic uh, elements of the Charter and Code, the real, the core issue uh, at stake is that research career are improved in terms of visibility, in terms of recruitment, in terms of transparency, in terms of involvement and uh, of uh, uh, commitment of the institution in their work with the researchers. And researchers are brought from a position of uh, subordinate or passive actors in a research centers or university uh, receiving a human resource policies from from uh, from the top into active actors. Uh, sorry for the calambu 
but uh, into an active uh, uh, subject, an active uh, partic participant of these policies. So the Charter and Code uh, process uh, requires the involvement of the researchers, the active involvement of researchers in shaping and creating, participating uh, the, the strategies, the research strategies of the institutions. And this is a change in paradigm that is ongoing since the 15 years. And of course, uh, has, to, has to evolve into a, a, a full, hopefully into a full synergy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michele. Uh, let's keep in mind visibility, um, transparency, involvement, and commitment. And uh, I have seen that uh, Connor, Connor would like to say something, to add something to, to this. Thank you very much, Berta. Um, good morning, everybody. Yes, I think, I mean, Michele has expressed it very well in terms of the broad, greater recognition of researchers at national level and at institutional level. But I'd like to give you two very specific examples of how things have changed. And this is, of course, it's from Ireland, where I come from, so I know, I know it best. One of our universities, um, University College Cork, has, and indeed, not just U U UCC, but all of the other universities have changed their human resources in that they have dedicated staff for researchers within human resources. Because, and, and, and I think this is characteristic, not just in Ireland, but of universities across Europe, that um, PhDs and particularly postdocs, researchers at the R2 level, were never really considered as staff. They were temporary people that came paid by, by the European Commission or by national funding agencies and moved on. That has radically changed now in terms of providing them support and training for their careers. And University College Cork is a very good example of that, that they have a dedicated HR unit within there that supports researchers, not only for careers in academia, but they also have strong links to external organisations of businesses and non-governmental organisations to show researchers different opportunities in terms of where they can pursue a career. The second example is an interesting one because I was asked um, uh, just over a year ago to one of our universities, I won't say which, um, to, ha to, to, um, to, let's say, facilitate some sessions between researchers in the institutions as part of their HR, uh, their HRS formal process. And what it meant was they brought together, for example, I was at one session where we had all of the, uh, let's say, or two researchers, the postdocs. And what, what came out very clearly um, in, that, um, in, in that session was that postdocs typically in universities are asked to supervise students. They're asked to give tutorials. And this is, this is very common. However, what came out was the salaries they received for doing that work was different in the different faculties of the university itself. And this is not a big university. This is not a very big one. And of course, there was uproar in the room. People are saying, this guy's getting paid more than me. This is not fair. So the consequence was they all got, they all got their salaries raised to the same level. That was, I mean, that's a very practical um, impact of, of the hate. But without the HRS 4 process, it is very unlikely those people would have ever come together. And I think that's characteristic of it brings together researchers. It brings together human resources. And it brings together, let's say, the broad research community of, of, of the institution. I realize it's different from CSIC as a national research or performing organization rather than a university, but these, these are very clear examples of where the impact of HRS for all has been. Thank you. Mm. Thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Connor. And it's true that it's, uh, it will be challenging for the institution. And uh, there is another question, maybe Carlos Garcia, uh, who will moderate uh, this, se this session uh, together with me, would like to, to launch the next question. Carlos? Yes, thanks, Marta. Uh, good, morning. good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, what do you think are or will be the crisis and reluctance shown by the research community to the strategy? 
someone. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the audio was breaking down very uh, highly. I, I couldn't hear, I could hear only half of your intervention. Uh, could you repeat? Uh, what do you think are or could be uh, the greatest uh, reluctance shown by the research community to the strategy, to the implementation? Connor, <laughs> you are the assessor, so. Okay, well, this is interesting because um, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm actually going to come back to that way in my presentation when I talk about implementation within CSIC. Um, change, um, particularly for the more established researchers, um, and, I, and I'll focus on one aspect of it, of, um, of recruitment and career assessment of the of the various um, attributes of researchers need. At the moment, in most organizations, the focus is purely on research, on publications. And, um, and even, I mean, I'll focus just on publications for a moment. Um, the established research community, many of them are quite opposed to open science because it goes against what they've been doing for many years, working with the large publishers. It's easy, it's straightforward, they've been doing it the change to open science is quite challenging there. But also part of the, and, and as, 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 you, as you well know, part of the, of, of, of the idea of changing research or career assessment is to look at other competences and attributes of researchers in terms of their abilities to, for example, interact with other sectors, to work across disciplines and even to communicate publicly the type of research they do as well. To have, and, 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 and this, there is a good level of resistance amongst the established research community to these, to these changes, because it, um, uh, the, the argument is usually put forward that it lowers the excellence, that the focus should be on the excellence, which of course it should be. But also from the researcher's point of view, Having these other aspects taken into account supports their career development in, in giving them other opportunities for work outside the purely academic sectors. I'll come, I'll come to this in a little bit more detail in the presentation, but, that, but there is certainly resistance there. The other one, and this is an important one too, is that um, part of what, a key part of the, um, of, of, um, of the charter and code and the HRS4, of course, is continuing professional development of researchers through training. And training, of course, from let's say the supervisors or the lab leaders point of view, takes their researchers out of the lab and takes them out to go and do something else, which they do not consider important. Their researchers are there to do the research in the lab. And you get significant resistance to that. And, um, and researchers are in a hard, in, in, it can be in a very difficult position because they have to report back to their boss, whoever their supervisor or research manager is, and, um, and they have to say to them, I want this time out to do this, do this research. Say, I don't think it's important. You should stay in the lab and do your work. So that there is clear resistance there. But, um, but the only way to do that, the only way to deal with those kind of issues is one, either, make, well, it, it can be made mandatory, and certainly some aspects, I mean, for what, what was spoken about earlier on about good scientific practice and that, which, which I, I've been reading for the documentation of that, which looks really interesting, that is something that should be mandatory. Researchers have to know about this, so they have to get trained in that area. And um, so there, 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 there is resistance in the, in, in, in the research community itself, but principally from the more established senior community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Connor. Uh, very interesting. Uh, we will uh, come back uh, to you later on after the, uh, this session. And uh, while the interaction of the researchers with other sectors and uh, other disciplines is so interesting, and our organization launched it uh, two years ago, an initiative about the interdisciplinar uh, thematic platforms where uh, the, our organization um, 
try to bring together uh, different researchers groups and uh, interact with uh, companies outside uh, academia. So um, this will impact uh, in the research assessment uh, reform. Um, and then uh, there is an, another question, for example, uh, that uh, we need some tips uh, for institutions like uh, the CSIC with a large number of uh, researchers and uh, geographically dispersed with more than 120 research uh, centers uh, this, in Spain. Um, do you have uh, good practices or um, tips uh, for an effective uh, implementation of the action plan? I don't know, maybe Connor or Michele, Xavier. Who wants to take this one? I'm, I'm happy to take this one. I, I think, yeah, I mean, it's one, it's one of the points I was going to make in, in the presentation. So, um, so it, it, it is challenging for a large organization. I mean, the, I, I see two sides of it. On the one hand, it's challenging, but then the positive side is you are a large organization. You have a reach across the entire country. So you can really instigate change at a national level which will be noticed by everybody else. So I think, so that's the positive side. The negative side, of course, is that it is tough to, while you can focus on it at, at let's say, a central level, but then to embed that in each of the, in each of the centers across Spain is challenging, of course. But there's a number of things. One is that the, the whole approach should be made seen as something really attractive for researchers. In other words, that it, it is something good for them. It's good for their research career. It is something that they will want to do. And that will mean strong communication. And it will mean as well, I mean, one way, the best way to get at researchers is to have ambassadors, what you might call local ambassadors, who will promote this locally and who will be engaged with your working groups as well. That will be most important because that's going to be the challenge of that core level of coordination across the, across the entire organization. But it is to make this attractive to people. And of course, if, if people see something as attractive, then it becomes bottom up. It can be hard sometimes at top, at, at, let's say, to get the, say, let's say from the center to make, to, to, to engage people who are at the management level locally and then get them to instigate the change. It is, it is far, yes, that, that has to be part of it, of course, but it is really important to ha get that bottom-up approach that you make it attractive and interesting to individual researchers to say, yes, I want this. You know, why can't I get access to training here? When are you going to introduce the training? And I think that, that, that and then the, the other side, of course, is, Given, given that you are a large organization, you can change things at an organization level in terms of the criteria for research or assessment in recruitment, et cetera. So that is something where there's a lot of, there's a lot of, that's where the central power becomes really, really, really useful at that level. But I think it is important to engage the, the, each center through their researchers. And of course, at management level as well, at HR and, and senior research level in each, in each center. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Connor. Uh, very good uh, tips, ambassadors, strong communication. But uh, we can start with your presentation right now because you have a, a lot of uh, words to say. <laughs> and uh, just to, to present you, you are an independent consultant uh, on research and higher education policy and, and, and funding. And uh, you have been chair of the European steering, uh, uh, steering Group on Human Resources and Mobility since uh, 2012 till 2018, focusing on researcher career development as part of the European research uh, area. And chair also of the European Commission expert uh, working groups on open science. Uh, since uh, 2016. So uh, please, the floor is, is yours and uh, we will continue with the questions uh, after your presentation.
Now, can you all see the presentation? Excellent. Before I, I, I go into the details here, and I'm delighted to be here today, it's actually, it, 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 it's, uh, I'm often talking to individual institutions, but of, of course you are an individual institution on one level, but I've already said you, you, you have so many centers across the country. It's a very, very large organization with great potential to make real change here. I think the first thing to say is that over recent years, the people actually began to believe that the HRS 4R was beginning to slow, like sort of disappear, the importance of the charter and code, it didn't seem to be as prominent from the European or the Commission perspective. Well, the good news is that that has all changed. We, we now have a new European research area policy, a new era pact between the European Commission, member states and, st and key stakeholders. And within this, there is a very, very clear focus on researcher careers and the need to strengthen the Charter and Code, and indeed the HRS 4R. So that is, a, that in, in terms of European policy, this is really important because there is the recognition of the importance of the researcher in the context of EU policy. And, um, and most recently, in fact, under the, under the Portuguese presidency, there was a communication from the member state, from, from the European Council of Ministers, focusing on researcher careers. And this has not happened uh, for about nearly, nearly, nearly 20 years from the very beginnings of the European research areas. And they recognized issues around the precarity of researcher careers, the lack of stability in terms of contracts, and also what was very clearly recognized was that the system at the moment produces large numbers of researchers most of whom want to be stay as researchers, but the reality is in terms of their job opportunities, that is not going to happen. Those opportunities are not there. This is not a national, it is a global problem. And in terms of, um, ju 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 just, to, just to focus as well on, on, on the point you made at the beginning in terms of my work here, is that um, at the moment I'm working on a project which is almost complete. It was a, cons a uh, it was a group of consultants, and we in fact we collaborated with um, with uh, Javier and Is Ascun on the um, on the project is on the evolution of the Charter and Code, the HRS 4R, and your access. So things are changing. So there there will be renewals and changes in this. But the but the important thing is it won't impact on your status. It won't impact on the award that you have at the moment. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. The first slide I just want to focus on this here. In 2007, the world population of researchers has gone up by 21%. That was between 2007 and 2016, with 7.8 million researchers globally and 22, over 22% 22 in the European Union. But the number of academic and research positions globally has not changed. At least it has not, certainly not kept pace with this trend. Now, the latest data, there was a report released by UNESCO in June of this year. And the latest data showed that that number of 7.8 million had increased by a further nearly 14% by 2018. So what we see is a growing number of researchers globally. And in terms of job opportunities, less job opportunities where they would like to be. But that being said, if you look at the employment rates of PhD graduates, they pretty much all get jobs. And that's what's most important. They will get a job. Of course, they may not get the job where they want, but nonetheless, it is not as if people are, are out of work. They are not. They are most certainly, they are most certainly employed. But many very unhappy because they're not where they want to be. So let's go straight in. Let's jump straight into the CSIC. And I've read through your gap analysis. I've read through your checklists, the, um, the action plan, and then the revised action plan with the greater focus. Um, your gap analysis is excellent, I think. And I think was perhaps a little bit over self-critical, but that's maybe no bad thing at this particular point in time. But I think it was a little bit over self-critical. Some things, some of the issues that you've raised, and, and, and again, what, what, I, what I want to, what I want to do today is, 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 is keep this in the broader context. You've looked at it internally from your own organizational point of view, 
But many of the issues that you come up against are ones which are faced by institutions, universities, and large research centers right across Europe. So some of the issues you, you have and you've identified in the gap analysis, they're beyond your control. I mean, you're not in a position to control national legislation where there's specific legislation in terms of recruitment and positions. And particularly as a large public body, there are certain, you know, there are certain things which you do not have the flexibility to do, as indeed is the same for many universities. So I think um, what's always important to do is to, is to identify clear, very clearly where you can take actions and where you can't. Where you can't take actions, um, the best thing is to communicate it very clearly to your researchers. That yes, if somebody says, well, what about this? You know, you're not changing this from the Charter and Code. Say, well, we can't. This is national legislation. You can, of course, lobby to get that legislation being changed. There are also, in terms of the other points you've raised in the gap analysis, there are issues which are common to many, many research performing organizations. Um, for example, for researchers in terms of recognition, lack of recognition for public engagement, for mobility, interdisciplinary, international, intersectoral, access to and access to career advice. The recognition of the profession for PhDs, and I think you, you, you make the point very clearly that for you, the PhD is a student, it's not an employee. This is typical, the same in Ireland. PhDs in universities and other organizations are students, they're not employees, except for some exceptional cases. In other countries, they are full-time employees, in the Netherlands, in, um, in Germany, etc. But I think one of the things I just wanted to point out here, I think that having the prizes and awards is a really an excellent proposal. It's a great way to motivate people and make them feel part of the organization. And it's done, I know it's certainly done by institutions in Ireland. I've sat on an awards committee recently for not just for PhDs, but for postdocs and for senior researchers as well. These, these initiatives, at one level, they may not seem that big, but they're actually, they, they, have, um, they have, let's say, a very inclusive effect and impact for the researchers themselves. One thing you raise, and I think this is an important one about stability and permanence of this one about stability and permanence of employment. I think that what's always got to be recognised: not everybody that comes to CSIC is going to get a lot, is going to get a permanent job there. That's that's a fact of life. Like for any organisation, large any research organisation. So what's most important for people who arrive is giving them some certainty about what their career path can be. And through the initiatives you're doing, for example, the training, to be able to say to people, well, when you come to CSIC, we will give you these training opportunities to develop your career. We won't guarantee you a job because that we can't do. You will have to, you will have to, if there are jobs available, you will have to compete for them like everybody else. And it will be based on your research excellence and other factors. But the point is to show people where they can go. And if they have opportunity, to give them those opportunities, for training so that when they are looking for another job, they have other things to talk about in their CV, not just how many publications they've done, but for example, their leadership skills in helping to run a laboratory, which is pretty, pretty important in any, other, in any other sector. Their ability to produce high quality scientific publications is not just about the research quality, it's also about the fact being able to write. And of course, in this case, if they're scientific publications, they're primarily writing in English in many cases. So they're writing in a foreign language, which is, a, which is another attribute that, that can be part of it. So it's to, it's to show them that they may not have a career in CSIC, but CSIC will provide them the support to establish a career, whether it's in research or in other sectors. Teaching is one which comes up. Now, the first thing is teaching can only be when possible and appropriate. It's not always possible. And in your organization, of course, it's not because you don't teach. Um, yes, I've seen, yes, that there are, <coughs> excuse me, if there are links with, other, with, with local universities, yes, you can engage people to some extent. But there is the other aspect of teaching and that is mentorship. And this can be, for example, senior postdocs working with PhD students in, um, in labs, helping them along. That can be, that is a form of teaching. And, um, and of course, for people at that level, they are learning how to supervise. They are learning how to guide other researchers. So uh, don't narrow the focus just to teaching itself, because you can spend a lot of time, I think, on trying to organize 
special teaching sessions for people in universities, whereas maybe it's better to actually utilize their skills internally to help, let's say, new researchers and, uh, and more junior researchers. Complaints and appeals, this is, a, this, this is always an issue that, and um, it's a common issue for universities as well, because there's always, I mean, there's usually a very strong disciplinary and appeals process, well, well, well established for employees. But when you have researchers and, and, and PhDs, which are in a very different position to an employee because they are very much dependent on their supervisor. So the interaction is, is different. It, it, it is more challenging. And that is, a, that, that is I mean, th th there is no easy answer to this one. But of course, I can see that you're, you know, you, you're taking this head on in terms of how you're going to deal with it. So these are these were my, let's say, observations on the um, on the gap analysis and indeed the OTMR checklist, which again I thought you were very, very explicit and very open in terms of your your, your um, where you saw the failings and, and the lack of action at the moment. Excuse me. The action plan, and <clears throat> I think what I mean, Michaela, I've, I've directly copied Michaela's slide, and you've structured things this way. The key things around here: working conditions, social security, recruitment training, career development, and the ethical and professional aspects. The action plan itself that you have, I think it's excellent. I think you've got some really innovative content, content there. As we've already talked about, I've already mentioned, it will be challenging to implement. There's no doubt about that because you are a large organization, but, and, and certainly you can make the legislative changes, the regulatory changes centrally. You can do, I mean, the one, the, 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 the good thing about a large organization that in terms of the translations of documents and that this is something then when done once it's done and it, it can be spread right across the organization. Single organizations find this more challenging because it's only really going to a small number of people. But that, 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 you know, that, that will have a very positive impact in terms of your ability to communicate internationally and to communicate a lot of administrative details to researchers themselves. But the biggest challenge for any organization is, is getting the change in culture of the people themselves. And what I mean by the people themselves is the established, typically the established research staff. And I say there's like some aspects are straightforward, but some aspects, not, I say may be challenging, but actually will be challenging. Changing the researcher assessment. That is, um, and there's a number of reasons why, I mean, from an internal point of view, as I mentioned in, in answer to one of the questions there in the previous session, changing researcher assessment comes up, comes against quite a, a good bit of pushback from your more senior researchers who see the other aspects of what people do as not being that important. And um, and yet it is. The other part of that is the external change, because if you change the way you assess your researchers, the challenge for them is then, well, but what happens when I go to look for funding from one of the national funders? They they only look at research excellence; they don't look at anything else. Well, I think the good news is that within her, uh, in particular because Horizon Europe, which is implementing the European Research Area Policy, is bringing in these changes. And as you know, the um, European funding agencies, in particular, through Science Europe, uh, has been led by Science Europe, but there's many other funders in there who are not part of Science Europe, are bringing about change in not just in open access to publications and the so-called plan s for open data but also in terms of researcher assessment so there is broad change happening across europe and i think we'd see more and more pilot let's say uh, pilot schemes within horizon europe in terms of researcher assessment so externally the system is changing and um but as i said it is challenging for the more senior researchers. Engaging researchers in training, and I already mentioned this, that it needs to be attractive. And that means, what's attractive about it? It needs to be something where it can be recognized in terms of what they have done. 
Now, universities are typically bringing in, let's say, some universities bring in what now they call for the PhD students, what they call a diploma supplement, where they identify the courses and the trainings that the, that the PhDs have done. So as a way to communicate this to external employers. This can be this can be quite effective for even for researchers. But also, of course, within internally in the organization, if you are recognizing some of the aspects of the training in terms of researcher assessment, then this Again, it can engage researchers. But it's all about, I think, of motivating researchers through providing the training, which you explained to them is going to be valuable for their careers. I mean, why should people follow, for example, the training on the whole area of good practice in, in um, science, research misconduct, ethics and that? Well, one, because it is really necessary as, a, as an emerging researcher to do that. Secondly, it is something which we see globally as becoming more and more important in terms of research misconduct and falsification of data and evidence in science. So it is very important that new researchers coming through are really, really well aware of this. The third point I just wanted to talk about the challenging is the, is the concept of the mediator you're bringing in. And um, as I said, for, for existing staff, the rules and regulations are pretty clear. There's not a problem there. This one of mediator is difficult, is challenging, but look, there is there there are good practices in other countries where this has been done. So you would not be the only people doing it. I know Luxembourg has done this. Uh, is in are, is certainly in the process of doing this for their university. They're they're lots small, they're quite small country, but they have one university and three three large research centres, and they have done this for their research junior researchers and PhDs in those countries, in, the, in those institutions. So that, that, that there are examples of, of how to do this, but I'm just saying that it, it, it will be a challenging thing to implement. Looking at, um, and I want to go to this, because in terms of training, people talk about it all the time. And a, a very large study carried out by the commission, the MORE 3 project, which it, um, it had over 10,000 researchers surveyed across Europe, that in fact, only 33% only of researchers receive any skills training during their PhD. And uh, so it's actually a very small number. People talk about it a lot, but in fact, the reality is it's not that large. I mentioned to you about um, recognizing in some way the skills that people have learned through their training. Well, this is something that we did in Ireland which was for PhD graduates. And this is called the Irish University's PhD Graduate Skills Statement. Now, I've just picked out one page of it here because, of course, at the beginning, it, it focuses very clearly on the fact that the PhD graduate is somebody who has developed the ability to analyze complex problems and solve them independently through research. But of course, there's lots of other skills that they learn either formally or informally as part of the doctorate. And indeed, one could have such a communication for, for, researchers, for researchers themselves. If you look at communication skills, people demonstrate effective writing and publishing skills. They are able to teach the support, the learning of students. I realize this for universities, but the, 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 the point is that to be able to show your researchers and say to them, when you do get when when you are trained in, in, in CSIC, you know, this is what you will have. In addition to the quality of research you will have performed, you will have all these attributes. You'll have worked in teams. You'll have worked in a collaborative environment. And this is something people don't even think about. You know, if you got, if you want if you're working in science, if you're working in a lab, you've got to work with some pretty difficult people sometimes, but you've still got to work with them and produce the produce the results. You often have to manage a system. You often have to manage your boss, which they can be pretty strange sometimes, especially as scientists. I'm one myself, so I'm, I do understand that. Um, and um, and understand you know, leadership and team environments. So these are all really valuable skills for researchers. When they leave, if they stay in the, if they stay in the research community, or indeed they go outside the research community. So these things are, I, I, I think it's it, 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 this engagement of researchers is a really important aspect. Let's just look at the action plan implementation and some points I wanted to make on that. First one is um, 
in implementation. Steering committee. You've got a very high level of steering committee, which is critical. But, and the big but is, they are hard to engage because these people, you know, they've got day jobs, they're doing lots of other things. And it will be important to just keep that in mind. I mean, that is the same for any initiative with large organizations. So, but I, I just think, you know, it, it has to be dealt with, but it's something to keep in mind. And what will be most important is to ensure that all the steps that you are taking in the action plan and the implementation of the action plan are fully endorsed, are, commun are well communicated to the steering committee and fully endorsed and supported by them. Because what you don't want, I mean, what you don't want, especially in a large organization, is somebody going to the head of their, inst head of their institute saying, hey, what's this? You know, why are the people in Madrid telling us to do this? We didn't agree with this. And where you want that person to say to them, no, 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 this is part of our HRS 4 or implementation. This is part of our institutional strategy. This is what we are doing. So does that communication will be quite important. In terms of the working group, now, of course, this is where the real work gets done. And you need the time commitment of the members. You need to ensure that people have the time and the capacity to actually do the work on this. Because, of course, all of these people are in, they have other tasks, other jobs. And it is important to underline the importance of this. And to do that, it needs to be clearly sanctioned by the steering committee and recognized by their line managers as important work for CSIC. Because if you have somebody who's, you know, they're, they're not at a, at a senior, senior level, they're at a, a, a mid-managerial level, then it is really important that if they say, oh, I have to go to this meeting or I have to take a day out as part of the training for this, for this initiative, their, their, their manager has to say to them, yes, of course, this is important, you do that. So it, 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 it is that level of commitment right across the organization, driven from the top will be really important. And what I'm saying is not just for CSIC, of course, it's for any, any organization. Now, critical for success. I think the one thing which I was really, really happy to see was that the HRS4 is integrated into your strategic plan. That is critical because that is something which is led from the top of the organization. If the HRS4 is not integrated into, into the institutional strategic plan, then you're doomed to fail. As simple as that, but you have it, and that's a real, that's a real plus. The buy-in of the senior staff through the steering committee. You have a steering committee, you've already had them engaged in the whole process. And the important thing is to maintain that engagement now in the implementation. And that can be done through good communication. Now, again, I just say critical for success, the commitment and activity of the various working groups. Because this comes back to the point of, will they have the time, will they be given the time to do the, do the work on this? Uh, another, another, another specific aspect is you're engaging researchers in this. You will have, you have uh, PhDs and postdocs involved. Of course, they are temporary. They won't be there all the time. They will change. And it will be important to always be on the lookout for when you're going to need to replace these people on, on, on these committees. And of course, coming back to the point, their supervisors must be fully supporting their engagement in this. It must be very clearly communicated to their supervisors. This is an important aspect of their, of, of their work. And you can see it from the point of view of research or career development. You know, sitting on committees is what you do when you become an academic, when you work in large research organizations. You sit on committees, you participate in the management and administration of the organization as well. Everybody does. And the more senior, often the more senior you move up in the organization, the more committees you sit on. So it is, it is part of the researcher's career development. And I think even to engage research, you say to this, you know, this is good for you. This is not just an administrative chore. It is actually a good thing for your career to engage with people in a different way than research. Well, before I actually hold off on the thank you, I think um, just, um, just looking a little bit into the future, and I just wanted to give you a, um, a, a flavor 
that I mentioned at the beginning that um, the your axis is changing. Oh, sorry, not your axis. The, the charter and code is evolving, and, um, and and Javier has already has already you know presented how how it's changing. I mean, the content is the same. It's the focus is, is, is shifting somewhat. The, the new issues, the the greater focus on open science, etc. Things that weren't there 15 years ago. The second thing is that um, the um, the way that things are going to change is that in terms of HRS 4R, there is to be better engagement. The Commission is going to look at better engagement with national aid funding funders because it's not just about you as research performers. The funders must change because they're the ones that actually provide funding for PhDs, for research projects. They have to change the conditions that they impose for the researchers that are hired on these projects as well to broaden their career um, support training. And um, to have more tools in place for better, let's say, mutual mutual learning and exchanges of good practice. I think that um, you know some of the major the, the, the major value of the HRS for is that it can give rise to far better research career prospects for researchers themselves, and thereby in fact strengthening the organisation. It also, within the organization, I've seen this in many, in many places, that it, it gives a greater connection of human resources, administration, and research, which are often seen as two separate things. And there's often a certain dislike of, um, you know, the researchers comment, oh, the administrators, they make us fill out all these forms. Um, um, that, uh, as, if, as if these things weren't important, which of course they actually are. But the, the HRS4 brings these groups together in a very, in a meaningful way because you know, this benefits the organization. It is, I think, you know, just coming back to yourselves, I think it is, it is challenging for a large organization. But then the, 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 the plus side is by making these changes, you change right across the country. And already, I mean, Spain is one of the countries with the highest numbers of uh, institutions with HRS 4R. So you can really change the national land research landscape in this sense. And of course, push the funders to change as well. I think the initiatives you've, you, 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 you have within the action plan are excellent. And I must say, I like the, you know, the revised action plan with the very clear timelines and that it is challenging, it always is. But you won't re reach all, all, all your all your deadlines to, uh, as as planned. But if you don't if you don't set a deadline, you never reach them at all. So I think that, um, that one of the, the the coming back to some of the fundamental points is really good communication, making sure this is seen as really attractive to researchers and beneficial to the organisation because better trained researchers will perform better in the lab. This has been this has been seen in, in, in various, in, particularly in doctoral schools and doctoral programs, it actually works better. So all I, I, I'll say to finish with, well, good luck with the implementation and thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Connor. Very valuable presentation. Thank you for saying that uh, our action plan is excellent, but also for highlight, uh, highlighting the, what uh, are the challenging uh, aspects of our action plan. The research assessment change, the engage uh, researchers in, in, in training in these uh, skills, and the mediator concept, uh, for example. It's necessary, as you said, a, a very good and a strong uh, communication and um, okay, uh, I'm not researchers, a researcher, but I'm convinced, and I am already committed after <laughs> hearing all your your presentation. So I hope the researchers are uh, also. Uh, thank you. Ah, sorry, I have a problem here. Okay. And I hope that the researchers have enjoyed uh, also this uh, presentation and these uh, tips uh, to implement uh, the action plan. I don't know if uh, is there any question in the chat. Uh, Carlos, do you see uh, any question in the chat? Uh, no, but I have one, one question, uh, Connor. Uh, uh, in advance, uh, thank you, Connor, for your presentation and your uh, kind, very kind words and amazing tips. Uh, regarding the interim assessment, 
uh, what is the importance of the new or uh, revised gap analysis and play and plan action plan sorry what uh, what should we pay uh, special attention to um, i don't um I don't think there's anything you should pay special attention to because really all of the aspects are quite important. And um, I, 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 I wouldn't highlight, the, 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 the one that I would see be most important would be to, to raise the awareness of researchers themselves about this, about the fact that you are making changes in career development for them, for their benefit in the short and the long term. And, um, and not just for, I mean, and what's most important here, not just for, let's say, what you might call the temporary staff, the, the R1s and R2s, but also for your established researchers. So this is valuable for their own career development internally within the organization as well. Because training is not just for, you know, the, the new people, it's also for the more established. And sometimes it's actually very important for the more established staff, uh, even though they don't recognize it. And um, one of the most challenging things in universities has been, certainly in Ireland now, all new academic staff must go, must undergo training as, um, as, as supervisors before they're allowed to supervise PhDs. And um, they're not allowed to supervise a PhD without that training. And um, um, it is well known that there are many senior staff who should get the same training, but it's a lot harder to do when you've got um, when you when you've got senior people already who say, "Well, I've done this for you know ten years." Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, but you can do things for ten years, but you can do them badly for ten years. So uh, the but I think it's, it is it is communicating to your researchers the value of the training itself from their point of view that not just that this is something you know that they have to do yes they, they have to do ethics training they have to do training about uh, about good practice and research they should be doing training on intellectual property on how to protect intellectual property and they don't have to exploit the intellectual property themselves you have your own offices and that to do that but at least to know enough about it to understand what they should do they don't have to be experts on on providing open data in, in, in the open science context, but they should know enough about it to know who to talk to and contact to do these things. So it's, um, it, 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 it is showing your researchers that all of this is highly beneficial for them. And that um, while in the short term, you won't be, I mean, the, the, the changing the research, researcher assessment is not something that happens overnight, but to signal to them, that these are the plans, this is what's going to happen. So to have a, a good communication strategy there that will make it clear to the institute to, to all of your researchers what's changing and what the you know when this will happen. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. Uh, thank you. Thanks again. Uh, well, uh, we have seen that. Uh, Several questions uh, have been already answered uh, with your presentation. And, and so just to remind the attendees that uh, there is um, an official email address to, to answer and to, to get all the que new questions or comments on, on this strategy, that uh, you can see this email address in our website is uh, the acronym of the Human Resources Strategy for Researchers at uh, cesic.es. Uh, so I think uh, we are uh, coming to the end, and um, thank you very much uh, to all the speakers, to Moira Torrent and uh, Luis Montoliu, uh, for uh, telling us uh, which is the state of play of this uh, strategy. Uh, and then thank you very much uh, to Miquel and, and Xavier uh, from the uh, from Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology for giving us an update uh, about the uh, charter and, and code. And um, thanks a lot to, to Connor for having spent uh, uh, your time in analyzing uh, our action plan and giving us uh, so valuable uh, tips and uh, uh, advice. Uh, we are very grateful. And uh, to close the, this uh, webinar, uh, I'm giving the floor to Ana Orejas. She is the head of Human Resources Unit and the 
uh, human resources uh, a strategy for researchers implementation manager. So, uh, Anna, uh, Anna will close the, the event. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Berta. Uh, good morning, everybody. First of all, I, I would like to thank the very interesting participation of all the speakers in this virtual workshop. I am sure that this webinar will help us to implement the strategy in the institution, especially in view of the midterm assessment in March 2023. Indeed, these and subsequent workshops that we will carry out in the coming months are going to attain an increasing application of the charter and code criteria in the research community and in everyday research practices. And secondly, holding these uh, types of acts is important for us to increase the dissemination of the HRS4R in the institution, which is one of the first actions to be implemented according to our action plan. It's been more than two years since the president of the CSIC sent the commitment letter to implement the 40 principles of the charter and code via the HRS, uh, HRS4R. From the Human Resources Department, we launched the initi initiative with great excitement with the aim of improving the working environment and therefore attracting the most outstanding researchers within the European research area and beyond. During this time, we all, the working group, have studied the main gaps and we have uh, detected some opportunities to improve the institution's human resources policy a continuous enhancement of, among others, working conditions and career opportunity is one of the top priorities of the institution. From the beginning, the FASIC has shown his intention of wanting to align itself with and learn from the best European practices. In this regard, there is a strong involvement expressed by the organization. For instance, the working group with representation from all the departments of the institution and with weekly meetings, the steering commitment and the action plan itself. In fact, HRS4R is one of the most ambitious projects in the institution that has been very well received by research community and especially by the HRS4R steering committee. Proof of this commitment is that the institution has begun to implement almost 40% of the action plan, taking into account that we have more than one year and a half left to submit the internal review for interim assessment, we can affirm that the rate of execution of the plan is quite notorious. Despite of this, in the next few months, the institution has several challenges to face in, the, in this field. Among others, we have to continue aligning organizational policies with the HRS4R. We have to continue involving research community and other staff members in the implementation process. And according to the action plan, we have to implement 100% of the proposed action, which is quite ambitious in the words of the European Commission. Especially the TSIC, Assistant Secretary General of Human Resources, has to develop a key element in this strategy. I'm talking about the open, transparent, and merit-based recruitment of researchers. We are aware that this policy makes research careers more attractive, ensures equal opportunities for all candidates, and facilitates mobility. Always considering the Spanish law framework, we have to review our current policy practices and procedures in order to develop and put in place a revised OTMR policy that includes, among others, to achieve fair and transparent recruitment and appraisal procedures to publish in Euraxis all job offers, etc. Finally, and on behalf of the entire, entire HRS4R team, we hope that this workshop has been of interest to all attendees and we invite you to follow the next actions that we will be carrying out in the 
development of the HRS4R. Thank you.